Welcome back, everybody, to the Blue and Gold Podcast. This is your host, Joffrey Whitey, and we have the privilege... Oh, I forgot J.D. Kameen is my co-host. Sorry about Thank that, Thank you. JD. It's all good. We no have worries. the absolute privilege of interviewing Jesse Awuji, who's a class of 2010 graduate, uh, served as a SWO. I believe he's still in the reserve. Um, he is a NASCAR driver, NASCAR team owner, uh, serial entrepreneur, uh, real estate investor, uh, he's in the trucking industry and government contracting as well. Jesse Jesse does it all. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> yeah, Jesse, what? <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the show and uh, introduce yourself to the GOATs. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show today. And uh, it's been good. It's always great catching up with other Naval Academy folks as well and all the other Academy folks out there. You know, go Navy, beat Army. That's um, it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, it's been a crazy last now. Oh, no. 14 plus years since I've 14 years now since I've graduated from the Naval Academy. And uh, since then, you know, it's been a you know, little bit of a wild journey. So, you know, obviously graduated 2010, uh, played football there all four years. Um, and then uh, first duty station was down in San Diego, decided to go out there. Um, I'm a SWO, so I was on ships, and my first ship was a minesweeper. Went that interesting route at first for the first two years, and then from there went from the minesweeper to the amphib, and I was on a, a USS Comstock for about two, two and a half years or so. Um, and then after that, transitioned to shore duty. Um, shore duty was in um, Monterey, California. And in Monterey, I was there at NPS working uh, for setting student services or something like that on the staff. I wasn't actually going to school, but I was working on the staff there. <clears throat> and while doing that, that's when I was like really jumping into this whole NASCAR thing, right? Like I had this crazy wild thought in my head that I could become a racing driver. So I decided, you know what, let me, uh, let me figure out how to make this happen. Like what pieces of the puzzle can I put together? Even though I was coming from a background that normally doesn't just go into NASCAR, right? Most drivers yeah. that you see in professional racing, whether it's NASCAR, Formula One, IndyCar, whatever you name it, most of these guys and girls start when they're, you know, six, seven, eight years old in go-karts and then work their way up from go-karts to this and that just like, you know, football when we played football a lot of people started in little league and then went from little mm-hmm. league to this and that and kept on going so a very very interesting journey <laughs> um uh, it was a grind a lot of fundraising right and and for anybody out there who's a business owner you already know when you're starting anything you gotta you know you gotta get the funds to do it and in racing racing costs a lot of money it's not like football it's not like basketball it's not like you just get drafted or something like that you literally got to find a way to fund your journey whether it's sponsors or really wealthy parents I don't have wealthy parents and I couldn't <laughs> find sponsors at first. So I basically took the entrepreneurship route and started my own businesses to make extra money on the side to get myself into racing. <laughs> Man, that's, that's that is amazing. a crazy story of all the <laughs> Naval Academy grads of, that like do interesting things. You may be like the most interesting case study. <laughs> it's it's uh, so different. different. It's so <laughs> different. And I feel like you're totally right. It's either people that start when they're four or they're yeah. just like exorbitantly wealthy and they started as like a pastime. I could be wrong about that, but that's what it seems. To actually that's create a business out of it is so cool. I need to hear like every detail about this because it's crazy. Yeah, that's insane. I have a question. How did you overcome the naysayers? Because I remember yeah. you started talking about NASCAR back when I was at NAPS and you were in Sin and you were coaching us and everybody was like doubting you. They were like, what is, this dude is crazy. He's never going to be a NASCAR. <laughs> cars, going to the track and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 So yeah. How'd you, how'd you overcome the naysayers and everything like that? Cause I, I know people, I know you had people in your family doubting you. You had, you know, your own players doubting you. You had your own friends doubting you. How'd you overcome that? Yeah. All right. Okay. So going back. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, overcoming the naysayers, overcoming, you know, even negativity, all that stuff, people telling me it's not possible and stuff, right? I think anybody jumping into any crazy journey will go through that, right? Anytime we're trying to achieve something way higher than where we're at right now, most people don't really aim high like that, right? I think, I think that's the fault for a lot of people in this world, right? A lot of people are too scared to go after their goals and dreams because not, not that they're that people aim too high and hit is that they aim too low and hit. That's what ends up happening with a lot of people. For me, I never had that as a fear inside of me. So for me going after goals and racing go, or going after racing is being one of my big goals, trying to make that happen. Um, I knew that it was going to be tough. I knew that a lot of people 
hadn't really gone through my journey. So I was going to have to forge it myself. Um, even though when people told me it was not possible in my mind, as long as I seen it, then I knew that, Hey, God put this in my mind. God put this vision in my head and showed me that it was possible to become a racing driver. And, uh, I knew that all I had to do was basically put action towards it every single day. I had to continue to believe in the vision. I had to have faith. And, um, even when it got really, really dark that the next day, the sun is still going to rise. Right. And that's what I had to continue to remind myself every single day. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. So I was talking to Joffrey about it. We had a quick break there, but the, the thought of going into an industry that's so adrenaline heavy and also so capital intensive, what actually drives you? Like, what is the why behind your journey? Is it that you want to prove to yourself that you can do something that's really at the brink of, you know, excitement, or is it the business model that's really attractive to you? Or is it you're, you're an adrenaline junkie and that's fueling the capital, you know, uh, raising the, all that stuff. Like what is the drive here? Pun absolutely intended. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So the drive behind it. So me personally, ever since I was a little kid, when I was, you know, I would say five, six years old, whatever, I was naturally, uh, naturally gravitating towards cars and racing. So I used to watch the show. I don't know if you remember it. Uh, it was called like Knight Rider. Uh, oh, yeah. with, uh, David Hasselhoff. And then, uh, I watched the cartoon, uh, speed racer. Uh, there was another show called Viper. I Viper. I was figuring yeah. Viper. Yeah. 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 I think that lasted for a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It, it didn't last that long, but I watched stuff like that when I was a little kid. So naturally for whatever reason, no one in my family was a car junkie at all. Nobody. Like I wasn't, my dad wasn't like into cars like that. My family wasn't into racing. Nobody was the only racing because my family uh, immigrants from Nigeria. My parents came from Nigeria in the eighties. You know, the only race that they know of in Nigeria is foot racing. That's it. There's no like auto racing. So um, I was like the only one who just out of nowhere just, you know, went off the beaten path and decided that like cars and racing was the thing that I was going to love and enjoy. You know, also football too as well. So that was kind of like the beginning driving force behind it because eventually I, I never thought of myself becoming a racing driver when I was, you know, a kid, even in high school, even in, even in college. I never thought of myself becoming a racing driver. It really wasn't until about uh, probably – Early 2014 is when I true like when I first had these real visions, seeing myself mm. become a racing driver. And for whatever reason, I just consistently saw myself like walking out for driver intros in front of a big crowd of 50, 60, 70, 100,000 people, whatever it is. Like I saw that like over and over and over. Every time I eat, I'd, I'd, I'd see it. Every time I went for a run and to work out, I'd see it. Every time I just went anywhere, was just thinking or whatever, just daydreaming. Like I kept on seeing it over and over. And at that time, I was doing like basic, like amateur level stuff, right? So I was taking my personal street cars to local tracks in Southern California. And there's, can't remember how many tracks, but yeah, Button Willow, Auto Club Speedway, Willow Springs, well, yeah, a bunch of different tracks. So I was going to all these for fun on the weekends. You know, I'd, you know, do my ship stuff during the week. Maybe we go underway during the week, come back. If I was free on the weekend, I was doing what every 20 year old does on the weekend party. And then on the side of it, I was going to tracks. Um, so uh, while doing that is what kind of really built me up for it. And then eventually I was just like, you know, why would I continue to do this at an amateur level? I played college football at the highest level of college football, playing Division One football why not try to take my racing passion to the highest level possible and then that's when it hit me i was like why don't i try to become a professional race car driver and once i made that decision i've been the type of person any any time in life if i make a decision to go after something no matter what i got to put my all on it i got to put all my energy effort i got to have faith and i got to go after it because like i said before god put it in my head like he literally said hey this is the future like this is where you can be as long as you decide to continue to put in the effort and energy necessary to make it happen. And from there, I was like, no matter what, as long as I don't quit, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it to wherever I'm going to go. Even though I can't see it, right? Like, I, it doesn't matter. Like, I, I can actually get there. And you know, I tell people all the time when you're going after big goals and dream, right? You're trying to climb this crazy mountain. And when you get to the bottom of the mountain, right? You can see, before you get to the bottom of the mountain, you can see the top of it, right? It's very easy. We all see the top of the mountain. Once you get to the bottom, the base, all of a sudden you can't see that top anymore. All of a sudden, all you see now is probably like a dense forest, trees. You start climbing it up. You start getting tired. Your legs start getting sore. Uh, it starts getting dark. It starts getting cold. There's wolves. There's bears. There's snakes. There's all these things along the way. There's 
there's areas where it's very hard to traverse. You got to climb up different things. You might, it might get a little bit risky. You might fall. You might get hurt. This is all things that you encounter when you're climbing up a mountain. And as you continue to climb, literally, you cannot see the top anymore as you're climbing it. Well, what happens mm-hmm. is people quit. They can't see it anymore and they quit. And that's where you got to have faith, faith that when you were back, you know, 30 miles away and you clearly saw the top of the mountain, you have that mm-hmm. faith that it's still there as when you're climbing and going through that tough time. And you're halfway up it. Why would you quit? It literally hurts just as bad to climb back down a mountain as it does to continue to go up. So why not keep going up? And that's what I've always kept in my mind the entire time through, throughout this whole journey. So in the, w- without risking being cliche, I'll go the, the opposite of what I was going to ask. Cause I wanted to ask, you know, what about your military experience made you uniquely qualified to do this? But I think those attributes are very obvious, <laughs> like yeah. grit, perseverance, you know, <laughs> yeah. networking, that stuff. I think you can just tell for those of you who are watching it, but Jesse's personality almost like radiates through the camera. So I, I'm not doubting that raising money was a challenge. I mean, it was challenging. But oh, like, very challenging. Very challenging. Still challenging. But Not easy. <laughs> once, once you get the network formed and you're actually, you know, performing, it probably became less of a challenge to actually interact with those types of investors. But what about your military service made you uniquely unqualified to do this? Was there a complacency or was there a lack of creativity that you had to kind of shed from your personality? Because I have that in my own life. And I, I'm interested if that was something that you had to deal with too. Um, honestly, everything about my time in the military and you know time at the Naval Academy, everything about my entire life, not just what I was doing at the academy or you know as a SWO, but everything around it, I think is what helped me get to this point. So I know a lot of us in the military, right? Um, a lot of folks who get into the military for whatever reason, and I hate that this happens, but for whatever reason, it's almost like they make the military their life, even though it is your every single day job. It is something that you go deploy. You're, you're gone. You're focusing on that. It is your only job, right? You're not really doing anything else for the most part. Um, and for, but for whatever reason, they make it their life and they don't have two separate lives. I, I highly encourage anybody who's listening to this who's either in right now and going to get in whatever it is um do not make the military your life you need to have two separate lives you got to have your military Mm -hmm. life you put your uniform on and you're in military mode the moment you take it off you cannot still be military man or woman you got to have that second life and i think because the entire time i was at the academy and the entire time i was you know at least active duty i continued to maintain two separate lives i was i on my civilian side i was civilian jesse not that i was doing anything crazy that was you know something that we wouldn't do in the military but i just had two i had two different me's like i i, I had a me on the outside and that made it such an easy transition when i was dealing with all the stuff I had to deal with to get into NASCAR, right? Going and fundraising and talk. I mean, we don't get taught fundraising in, in, in the military. We don't get taught talking to potential investors. We don't get taught, you know, money. <laughs> we don't yeah. get taught any of that stuff. Um, but because I had the civilian side of me that was constantly yearning to learn these things and interact with these type of people and understand how to be around these certain circles and how to move around, how to talk to these people, like, I was constantly doing that stuff already on the outside, not even knowing what I was setting myself up for in the future. That's why I always tell people every single day, prepare for the fight. You don't even know it's coming. You have to, Mm. because once it comes, it's too late to start preparing. It's there. So every single day, prepare for the fight. You don't even know is coming. And that's what I always did. I constantly was preparing myself for the next thing. I didn't even know what the next thing was. I was just doing all the things I know are the right things to do to advance yourself in life. You keep doing Mm. that and it's eventually going to apply to the next thing you're doing. We don't know where life's, I don't know what's happening tomorrow. I really don't. I think I do, but I really don't. Like tomorrow I could get a call from someone all of a sudden, hey, we need you to be uh, whatever on this and that and be part of this and that. And next thing you know, it's taking me to this crazy level. But it would have never happened if I wasn't doing all the things that led up to this point. I wasn't Mm. continuously trying to put myself in better positions. When you're doing that, you're putting that energy into the universe, things start working out in ways that you would have never imagined. Man, Jesse got me fired up. I'm ready. No, seriously. <laughs> talk, talk a little bit about, um, you know, the the, the fundraising portion um, for your, you know, NASCAR journey. You said you have to you had to start like different type of businesses to begin yeah. with. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk a little bit about that journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I first got into racing, um, you know, I quickly figured out because I did my 
market research, I guess, <laughs> before I even knew what market research was. And I'm just researching, just figuring out what's out there, what's possible. How do you, how do you, how do you even make this happen? And quickly figured out that money was a big part of it, right? You got to pay for, you know, getting into racing, like cars, fuel, blah, 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 blah. You got to pay for all this crap. If you're going to go rent a ride from someone, which is what I was doing at first, because I didn't want to buy a race car or buy a team, um, you know, you got to pay to rent the ride, right? You, you, you find money, you give to a team owner and he lets you jump into the car so you can go race, you know, and it's, it's cheaper than going and buying, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment yourself. You just go pay, you know, a few thousand dollars and just go race their stuff for, you know, a weekend and help elevate yourself. Right. So I was doing that at first, but you know, when I first met the first team that I linked up with was a late model stock car team. And late models are um, kind of like the lowest level of stock car racing. It's like the entry level, but you know, you still, you know, you race at short tracks all over, all over the country. You mainly stay at your local place. I was at Irwindale Speedway in Southern California and um, you know, half mile track, you know, pretty good crowds would come there. We'd have anywhere from five to 10,000 people at the races. So it was like, it was like a big high school football game in, in a way. Like that's, that's, that's kind of how it was. It's actually a lot of people. I was surprised to hear that many people. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, we, I remember... I remember. I can't remember which race it was in the season, but we had we had multiple races in the seven to ten thousand people range. That's I mean, like horse racing. Back. Oh yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's it's a it's the the entire stadium is packed. It's like wow. legit. <laughs> that's cool. So, yeah, yeah. If you go to Bowman Gray in in in, in a North Carolina, it it. It literally is a high school football stadium, but they put a circle track around it, and that place <laughs> is packed out, like standing room only, like every single weekend. I'm looking it's up crazy. these places on my phone right now. They're cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, really, really good time doing that. So, anyways, as I once I uh, once I got there, the team I was running for, um, they were charging about five thousand dollars per weekend to go racing and as a lieutenant at that time um you know we make you know pretty decent money but not enough where i can go spend five thousand every other weekend on racing like mm-hmm. that wasn't gonna work you know, <laughs> so, you know like I, I had some i had some deployment money saved up so i you you know but i mainly use that to pay off other bills and get myself into a good financial situation whatever but and i had a little bit left over from that they're like okay i can you know the first race i can pay for it out of my pocket but after that like i, I need to find somebody else to pay for this because I, I can't keep doing it so so uh, the first race I paid for it, and even prior to that, I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew how expensive it was going to get, and I knew that I was going to need to try to find sponsors. So I'm looking for sponsors, and this was in twenty end of 2014 before 2015, because 2015 is when I first first started racing. Um, in 2014, I'm going, I'm literally emailing like multiple companies over and over and over. And I was, I think I was on the, pl- oh yeah, I was on deployment during this time. So I get off of watch before I go to sleep, you know, I just like hop on my computer and like send all these emails out or I'd, I'd go, you know, when we come into a port or whatever, instead of me going out and partying like crazy, I just go to my hotel room and just like spend all day, all night, just sending out emails to multiple companies, just trying to reach out if I need to get on calls or schedule meetings, and schedule it during that time. I was just grinding, sacrifice. you know? that's yeah. saying a lot on deployment yeah. oh yeah on deployment that's what I'm saying but I, I was like I knew what was next I knew how big this could be so I was like it wasn't even like like it sounds like sacrifice but it's like it really wasn't like this was like me like I you I had you had to you have to take it on as a lifestyle it's just like you know working out and staying in shape all the time right like you can't just make it a thing where you only do it seasonally and you're like oh I'm just trying to get in shape no 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 it has to be a complete lifestyle so that's what it was for me it was a lifestyle to go figure out a way to make this work and then it became less work when you did that. Um, so I'm doing that. I'm sending all these emails. I'm getting no's, 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 or not getting answered at all. I sent like a thousand plus emails and nothing happened. I'm like, oh, crap. Like, how am I going to make this work? And then I was like, okay, if no one's going to give me the money, then I'm going to go create it myself. So mm-hmm. then that's what I decided to do. So I was like, okay, how do I create it myself? Well, fortunately for me, one of the guys on my watch team, um, Ryan Hogan, uh, he was, uh, he's like two years or so behind me or something like that. Um, anyways, he was on my watch team and I just talking to him on watch every single night when there's nothing going on and you're sailing around the Arabian Gulf, you know, you get to talking and he was telling me about all his business ventures he had in the past and his new business ventures he was working on at the moment. I'm like, oh, cool. You're like a business dude. I was like, I could learn from you. So we're talking, talking, talking. And eventually I was thinking, you know, why don't I start my own business? So then I told him, hey, teach me everything you know about business so I can just learn. And literally, like, after watch, we even, we, you know, we'd have the zero to zero to 3 a.m. watch because we did, like, three on, nine off or whatever. Go zero to three get off at three, go find some classroom on the ship. And there'd be a few people from the watch team who was interested too as well. But slowly after time, all those people who were just interested were only interested. And I was actually the one legitimately trying to make this happen. So it got to a point where it was just only me in the classroom at that point. So um, 
he's teaching me, teaching me, teaching me. I'm learning, learning, learning. And then um, eventually I, I try to come up with some ideas. And um, I remember he was telling me his first big business venture was putting on these events, uh, like it's uh, running events or whatever. And I was thinking, I was like, I don't really know anything about running events, but I do know about drag racing. Why don't I try to take your concept of events and put it in the drag racing world? I mean, people put on events already. Why don't I put on my own with my own spin and market it the way I know how to market it on social media? Because I had a little bit of social media following at the time and I knew how to get people hyped up on social media and play with people's car egos, right? Because the car car world has all these big egos. So um, I did that and marketed my own event. Started put I um, I decided to market it actually while on deployment. I was like, I had I had I created this Instagram page once I got off on this port visit. And then like I start putting out information on how people can buy tickets for an event. Um, I, I called the track while on this port visit. Hey, can I rent your track? They told me how much it was going to be. I set this whole thing up literally on a port visit. Dude, and, this is, yeah. that, this is <laughs> awesome, like, man. This like, is hustle. Yeah, this is a straight grind. So I called the track, get that set up. I set up the ticketing site. I do everything. And then I did that like on the, like it was like a three day port visit. So I do knock out all that stuff on the first day. And then the second, and then the second day, um, yeah, some of the ship's crew, we wanted to go out and do some stuff out in town. This is in, I think we we're in Abu Dhabi, I believe. So we go out or no, no, sorry, Bahrain. And we went out, had a really good time. It came back that night. And I was like, you know, I had a really good time. So I came back and I was like, oh man, like I still need to put in some effort towards this stuff. So I go online and I, I finally like push, uh, publish for the event. I think I was using uh, Eventbrite or whatever, and it publishes it, pushes it out, and then I immediately hit up a few people. I'll just send them a link. Hey, I'm putting on an event. I know you go to drag racing events all the time. You should come to mine. And then one person bought tickets, and he bought like a lot of tickets. He bought a racing ticket, multiple spectator tickets, pit crew tickets, like $275 worth of tickets. And I'm like, holy crap, I just got my first sale. That's now awesome. I have to do the event. There is no backing out now. Like <laughs> somebody is entrusting me with their two hundred and seventy-five dollars that I put on this event that's going to cost me like eleven or twelve grand. I was like, Oh okay. man, this is great. <laughs> so now I got to keep going. So then it was like every single day, every time I get a chance, go online and just market, market, market. You know, and I was. I call it door-to-door -door sales, right? Like, you know how people normally go to literally to your door? I was going to people's DM boxes, right? I was DMing every, like, streetcar guy who had a fast streetcar, right? A GTR, Camaro, Corvette, whatever. And I was just DMing every single one of them in Southern California. I've been like, hey, we got this event. Eventually got, like, 60-something people to sign up to, to race. I got a bunch of spectators to come out. The first event we uh, this is once again I'm off deployment now. Um, the first event was in February of 2015, and two months after deployment, <laughs> and uh, we profited about three thousand dollars from the event. That's awesome happy. for the yeah. first event. First event. Yeah. I was Usually happy. it's the, a huge loss. Yeah, you, you lose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I profited three grand. I'm like, oh crap, this is cool. And I used part of that money to get myself into my first race, and also some money I had saved, saved from deployment. So I mixed that together. I'm like, this is cool. So like, I can Man. use business to make money to pay for my racing. But then I thought to myself, that was a lot of effort and a lot of stress to only make three thousand dollars. Three thousand is great, <laughs> but that was a lot of stress to just make that. And and the event's just a one day event, so not like you're physically doing a lot of work. It's just one day I did I did work, and I was like, okay. I got to remarket this event even better and I got to hype it up like crazy. My next event was going to be in August and I'll get to how I made it in life through that time because it was a long time. I had to figure out what other ways to find money. But the second event, we ended up profiting $27,000. What? Yeah. That's the insane. next event. 9X after... compared to your first event? Yes. The next event after that, we profited. The only reason I didn't profit 30 plus in the next event is because I raised the prize money. I went from giving away like $1,000 in prizes to like 10000 on the third event because for whatever reason, I thought people would want that. And then I found out that people don't care about the prize money that much, no matter what you put it at. So then I lowered hmm. it back down the next year to like, I don't know, a few thousand or whatever, and people were still cool. The next year, I had an event that profited. It was a two-day event. And I profited like 50-something grand um, from that. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Events, so, man. Events man. are <laughs> sneaky. Event, that's why I know, like, when I see things like Coachella and things like that, I know these guys are just bank bankrolling. Like, because I just know from me, like, you, you can cut. Like, I just had an event uh, this past weekend, and this one was a smaller event. It didn't even do that well. And when I say it didn't do that well, it profited like maybe twelve grand or so. 
And like you look into the stands, there's like barely anyone in the stands. There was yeah, ninety something racers there. You know, if you look at it, like you're thinking, okay, people are here, but there's no way he's really making that much money. It still made twelve grand, and it barely looked like anyone was there. Like like there is money if you do this stuff right. There is money. <laughs> so to the, mid- um, to the midshipman that just got offended <laughs> that he said twelve thousand isn't a lot of money. I promise. You'll <laughs> <you're true. laughs> <laughs> learn twelve can be eaten up that quick. Yeah, just me, I live in California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, um, that is so cool. That is. Yeah. Yeah. crazy so that like is, that is i can't dope. believe that is a story about hustle jesse yeah. didn't go out and hire some huge you know hundred thousand dollar you know marketing no. event platform he did ne- it in his dms <laughs> on <laughs> deployment you know while in uniform that's crazy so i have a flip side question and now uh-huh. that you like have found your passion mm-hmm. you know some people feel that way about the military and so that's why they struggle to have kind of two different lives because there's Mm -hmm. there's they feel the same way you feel about racing is how they feel about so do you still maintain sort of a different jesse to decompress you know non-racer jesse that's around the dinner table and stuff like that you know what so so that's the thing that's not what i'm great at though that's the thing i've i have there's there's multiple me's right there's the military me when i'm in military mode i'm doing that there's a business me when i'm in business mode and the business me is also the, the racing me too it all mixes together right hmm. but there isn't like i mean there is kind of another me but not as much i'm always kind of in business mode and the reason why is because any entrepreneur will know this like your your business isn't 8 to 5 p.m it's not it is from That's the true. moment you wake up <laughs> yeah so the next moment you wake up like that's it like typically we're right when you wake up too yeah 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 i mean especially when you're on the west coast and you got you deal with a lot of east coast folks my yeah. emails are already packed in the morning and the first thing i do every single day is emails and messages and see what i've missed and what's happening what fires potentially just happened all that stuff and i'm going through this so so it's, it's really hard to get out of that um, i i still like to have fun but i'm i, I think uh, fortunately for me i made my businesses and what i do to try to make money in my passions of what I love to do. So like in a way, mm. when you turn your hobby into things that make money, then all of a sudden you never feel like you're working. So even though I am constantly working and working on things, like a lot of times I'm having fun. Like, you know, after this, I have a, I have to head to the track and do a track day or whatever. But during this track day, that is fun. People look at it, oh, you're just gonna go play. Yeah, that's how you can look at it, but I'm also gonna make a YouTube video while I'm there. I'm gonna post it on YouTube. I'm gonna make some money on it. Not that much money, but I'll make a little bit of money off of it and continue to build my YouTube platform. That is work there, right? Like that is part of my job, right? My okay. my events that I do, like I've got like my first, I don't know, first few years doing the events, I didn't race at my own events because I was just busy doing the events. And then I finally got to a point where I got had it so set where I could finally bring my own cars there and race at my own events. So now I see my events as not me putting on an event. I see it as the track is open and I get to take my personal car to a drag strip and go drag race it. And by the way, while I'm there, shake some hands, kiss some babies and make sure people, you know, play nice and I get paid for it. So I'm getting paid Dude. to go have fun. So that's how I see it now. I don't even this see it as amazing. Work anymore. <laughs> so, I, I mean, like, oh, we got to do this. Uh, have you thought about doing one of these in Annapolis for midshipmen? How cool would that be? Like instead of going to the Bay Sox game, go to <laughs> drag race that's drag run race by it. a Naval Academy grad. The first yeah. drag racing event that I actually went to, not my own, but I went to, was in uh, Cap- a Capital Capital Raceway in Crofton, Maryland. Um, that's and I actually went as a midshipman. I was it was in my junior year as a midshipman. I took my personal car to like the track and just drag race with it one weekend. And then like that's the awesome. next year, I did it again one more time. And then I bought my Challenger after I graduated and went there again. And that's kind of how I got my start and going to any kind of tracks before it took me to other stuff. And yeah, it, it, it's just it's crazy where everything will take you because even this one event business like that's my first business and i still do it today but that's not my only business right i that led me into learning a lot about how just to keep a business running and then from there it led me towards figuring out the next business because once i transitioned out of the uh act, out of active duty and went to the reserves um i immediately was like okay i'm not getting my normal active duty pay anymore so i had to get like mm-hmm. a day job to sustain things because the events business actually made enough that would have easily sustained me but at that time once again i'm racing and i didn't have a lot of sponsors so i'm using all my business money to pay for my racing so i couldn't use it for me i was like i need a day job now <laughs> so yeah. i got the day job and after i got the day job it just took a little bit for me to realize like maybe a few months I don't know, five, six, seven months where I started realizing like, this isn't really for me. Like I was making decent money. This was like 2017. It's like a hundred grand a year. It was good. But like, I was like, like, it's not, 
yeah, but it's not enough. It's not me. Like I'm way more. Than, I knew I'm way more than that. So I'm like, like, why am I sitting here spending the? I, this is when it hit me. I'm like, I'm spending the best hours of my life each day to work for that person. I'm like, this is mm. not right. Like I could put those same. I, I'm putting all the best hours of my life to make her company fourteen, almost fifteen million dollars that year. I was like, why not just put that same? Because I'm literally directly like responsible for a lot of that. So why don't I just be directly responsible for me? You know, putting myself in a position to eventually make fifteen. I'm not making fifteen million right now, but what I'm saying is, I can put those hours into me. So yeah. then, outside of work, I was doing. I was I, w- I was working on other business opportunities, trying to figure out the next thing. And she wanted me. The CEO wanted me to focus on their company. I was like, hey, I'm making you more money this year than you made before I got here. And I'm doing this while being here and doing it remote. I'm going and racing. I'm working on other business stuff. I'm doing this remote thing before remote was cool. And um, she was like, no, we need you more physically present here. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. Like, I'm making you more money. So leave me alone and let me do my thing. And she's like, no, no, we need you physically here. And I was like, that's not going to happen. And she's like, okay, it's either going to be you or us. And like, she's sitting in my office. I'm like, it's going to be me. And she's like, all right, your last day is Friday. And it was like Wednesday. I was like, oh, crap. I just just got fired. (laughs) So I was like, but then I made a decision. Then I was like, I will never work for anyone else ever again. The government is all cool with it because I'm helping protect our freedoms in this beautiful country. But besides that, I'm not working for everybody else. So um, that I luckily, once again, remember I told you in the very beginning of this podcast, continue to prepare for the fight you don't even know is coming. I didn't Hmm. even know that I was going to get fired in October 2018 i didn't know that was coming right i planned on eventually exiting that place like maybe the next year at some point but not then but because i had been waking up at 5 a.m every day for three straight months to learn about the trucking industry before i went to work every Mm. single morning because i was preparing for the fight i didn't even know was coming once she dropped me i was like all right i'm starting my own trucking business there's profit in here there's money here there's opportunity why not and then I hit up both of my brothers who had been hitting me up, you know, constantly being like, hey, how can we get into the business? How can we get into the business? I was like, here's your time. I'm going to add you into the company. I need both of you to invest. I think they gave me both 35 grand each. I was like, both of you to invest. We're going to use this money. We're going to start a trucking business in the company. They're like, okay, let's do it. And I was like, I promise you I'm going to make this money a lot more than what it is. Instead of you looking at your bank account every single month, you can, and, and looking at it to sit there doing nothing, how about we put that money to work? They're like, let's do it. We came together. We started the trucking business. Uh, we went and bought the se- first semi truck maybe a week or so after I got fired. And then from there, we started the trucking business. And then we Dude, got into it. This is crazy. This is, we, 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 have the pause. we have the pause. So you accidentally got into entrepreneurship because you were trying to raise money yep. to fund your dreams. And you yep. ended up being an awesome business person and serial entrepreneur. That's insane. <laughs> Kind, yeah, kind of in a way. And, you know, my, my mom, I, I was, I learned a lot from my mom. My mom never like sat down and taught us these things, but we learned through osmosis, right? So my mom, she was a nurse. Uh, she worked labor and delivery. This, this lady would work like, like hundred hour weeks, like literally crazy, like crazy, 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 12 hours a day, every single day, plus overtime. And then she started her own business on the side. She had a party supply store and she was selling party supplies. Um, kind of like a, party city or whatever but hers was yeah. called Par- party r us and it did good it was making money um and we saw her doing that we saw her i'm like because i did the math i'm like mom you're you're getting to the store at 9 a.m you're leaving at 5 p.m you're going to your nursing job at 7 p.m you're getting off of like 6 or 7 a.m and then you're coming back to it and you're doing that seven days a week <laughs> you know so yeah. like that's how i learned it that's when i knew that like there's just no excuse there really is no excuse she can do that than I can. And she did that for like at least five or six years before she made well enough money that she'd go jump into doing real estate stuff. And now she just works her nursing job and does real estate stuff. Um, but uh, I was like, man, that's cool. So anyways, I just applied that to my life. And mm-hmm. and I thought she was crazy for working those hours. And I look at me, I'm like, dang, I wake up and I'm working from the morning and I don't stop until I'm like, it's midnight, make, 1 a.m., whatever. You do it. Yeah. yeah all of a sudden, it becomes it, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I think I get a little bit more sleep than she was, but like, yeah. <laughs> So are you the type of person now, I mean, you have some really track record of success also, Pun. Do you turn around at the naysayers and say, look at me now? Or do you say, thank you? Like, you're Um, part of the reason I'm here. How how does that hit your personality? The best revenge is massive success, right? Mm. Um, So I hardly ever look back at wherever those people are, what they're doing. Um, If I run across them, I'm like, ah, you know, interesting, right? But if, if if I get, if, if somebody is trying to oppose me, 
And like, once again, like I, everything I do, I try to do whatever God wants me to do. Right. And if someone is pushing against that, then they're not just against me. You can be against me. I don't care. But you're against him. Like, mm-hmm. and if you're, I feel sorry for you then. Cause like, like you're going to get whatever's coming to you and you're at where you're at in life for a reason. You know, I always tell myself, like, if somebody's like going against what I'm doing, and I know I'm not doing something wrong. I'm like, dude, you're, you're at where you're at for a reason. And you're going to stay where you're at for a reason or go continue to go down. So I, it just, for me, wherever, wherever people are at, whatever they're doing, doesn't bother me. Whatever they say doesn't bother me. Cause like, I'm like, I've always been the type of person always just, you know, continue to do the right thing. Be a good person, be good to other people. Um, don't screw people over. Always have good intention. You know, some people say, you know, jump into the business. You got to be a shark and you got to be this. I'm like, you don't just be a decent person. And yes, while being, you know, kind and compassionate and, and, uh, being a decent person, there will be times where you get screwed over. It happens. But at the end of the day, it's all going to work itself out. Like it's, 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 everything's already set. Like yeah. it's okay. <laughs> you know, just get through what you got to get through. He's not going to put you through what you can't handle. Yeah, absolutely. You touched on real estate. Um, are you a real estate investor? I've seen that in your uh, bio. If yeah, so, yeah. Um, what's the pr- first property you purchase? And do you have any regrets with uh, purchasing a property. We have a lot of uh, younger goats. Uh, shout out to the USNA Property Network um, that are buying real estate at this time. So yeah. Let's touch on your real estate portfolio. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the biggest thing with real, real estate is having a bunch of tools in your tool belt, right? Understanding, like having knowledge. Like before I even got into real estate, I did the same thing. I was waking up early in the morning, learning about, you know, just watch, listening to the podcast, Bigger Pockets, a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, every workout, I was listening to Bigger Pockets, Robert Kiyosaki, this and that, doing all that stuff. And I tell people there's uh, there's never a bad time to get into real estate, whether the market's the way it is right now or the market is perfect. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Like just jump in whenever you got to jump in and then make sure you have a bunch of tools in your tool belt understand what are all the different opportunities some opportunities aren't good at certain times and some opportunities mm. are better you just got to understand once you know which ones are good then you're going to jump in during this time there are certain opportunities that are great you know in three years from now when rates are wherever they are there are certain opportunities that will be even better so mm-hmm. um for me our first property because i jumped into it with my brothers we use, so we started the trucking company to make a lot of cash and it made a lot of cash. And then we had to figure out where to put this cash, right? Why are we going to yeah. take this cash and just like do nothing with it and look at our bank account? Like I, I kept <laughs> on thinking, okay, we're making money from this. Why not try to figure out a way to um, like be like the rest of the people in the world who get super wealthy? Like what are the wealthy people doing? And I kept on hearing real estate, real estate, real estate. And I, I never had a passion for real estate prior because like it was so boring and dry to me. I was like, it's so slow. And I'm like, oh, this is so like, this is so stupid. So um, <laughs> but when I realized that really wealthy people are like maximizing their wealth because of it, then it clicked for me. I'm like, okay, I can like this now because it's actually going to do something for me. So then I started learning about it. And then the uh, first thing we did was very, very simple. We bought a single family home in Indiana. We use this website called roofstock.com. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before. Um, roofstock.com, you can literally buy a property from your couch at home. You literally don't have to go anywhere. Even when it comes to signing the papers, they'll send a notary to your house and you can just move over to your dining table and sign it. We bought this property from the couch to this day. We bought that in 2020 to this day, four years later, I still have yet to see that place physically like with my own eyes. I've never <laughs> met the tenants that were there. I've, I've, I don't, I, I've never been there. I've never been there, but I do know this every single month we've been getting checks and the checks are profitable and we're not, we're not going in the red. We've been in the green the entire time. So I'm cool with it. It was a two bedroom, one bath, 900 and something square foot in Hammond, Indiana. We bought it for 128 grand. 1350 is the, uh, is the rent that they were paying. Um, and then the mortgage, I think we started off at 700. It keeps on increasing each year. It kind of sucks, but, um, uh, yeah, like it was a pretty good deal. And, um, unfortunately though, those tenants, um, for whatever reason, I don't know if they fell in hard times or whatever, they stopped paying in like December or something like that after like two months. And then our property manager was like, Hey, um, we probably should evict these people. And I was like, ah, well, is that going to be hard? And they're like, Oh no, Indiana is really easy. In like three weeks, boom, they're like out, gone, done, evicted. <laughs> On to the next. I'm like, holy crap, that was easy. That well, didn't happen like that in other places. No, so, not California. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Not California. <laughs> yeah, not California. So I was like, cool. So, anyways, and then it took like a couple months for them to get the place cleaned up and then free market the place. And then now they just got new. They, they actually just put it on the market like in the last two weeks. And then they, um, somebody's in there now. So I was like, cool. So there, and now the rent's up. 
more because the other people would never change the rent. Like for me, I was like, we're making money. I don't need to raise the rent each year. Like I don't, I, I don't know. I'm just not that type of person. I don't want to do that. So yeah. now that we're getting new people in, now it's time to raise the rent, right? Because now it's new people. They're starting off fresh. We raise it like a hundred dollars to fourteen fifty a month. And yeah, mm-hmm. once again, it's going to be profitable again. So um, yeah, yeah, that was the first property. From there, we moved and got. Um, what was the next deal we jumped into? Oh, what was the next deal we jumped into? We got a, a Airbnb in Denton, Texas. Um, that one's now turned to just conventional rental. Uh, we recently bought um, two years ago. We got a um, a, uh, um, a, a one acre lot in Oregon, and now we have a storage facility there. So it's for boats and RVs. Um, we're gonna we we built that one up for about. Uh, it took us 470 grand or so. Um, mm-hmm. and now it's on the market. Now it's filled up, it's 50% filled up and it's making money. It's actually profiting. Um, and then we are going to be selling it now here pretty soon. We're actually on the market now. Um, but we're selling it for 1.25. So Ooh. it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Yeah. Only 470 to get the thing done. And it's profiting right now. Like every, like it's like we're good. Like it's cash flowing. Like I don't have to like spend money on it anymore. So it's cool. Um, uh, what else do we got? We, uh, we jumped in on a syndication deal in Iowa with another Naval Academy grad. He brought us nice. into that whole thing, spent like a hundred grand on it. Not, not a lot, but like it was, um, we're making money on it every single 100 month. hundred G's is not a lot. You can, you can well, tell. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, like when, when, I, when you look at the you, like when you look at the grand scheme, like when I say not a lot, is because we spent a hundred. It was it was two separate deals, so fifty grand each one. But they're kind of it's the same group, and mm-hmm. you know there's people in there who spent like you know five hundred, six hundred, a million or whatever. So that's why I say it wasn't that much because like it's yeah. not that much compared to what some other people spent. We spent like the bare minimum you can do to get in, um, and then it's fifty grand each one. Um, and then that one will get sold in five years and we'll make money on top of it. But right now, every single month, we are cash flowing. They're like, they're like sending us checks every single month. Um, we're, uh, we, uh, we bought a piece of land in Houston, Texas. We're building, we built two units on it, um, two homes. Okay. Um, one of them is closing here in the next couple of weeks. The other one will be closing ho- or not closing, but hopefully being sold here in the next month or so. Um, that one took a lot long. That was like the only deal that's like sour to me because it took way longer than it was supposed to be. This is something we should have easily profited like a hundred grand on. And now we're only yeah. going to profit like maybe like 30. Gotcha. <laughs> so like gotcha. I'm, I'm still I'm winning. Winning yeah, still, still, but like I'm not happy that it. It's just because we had to spend a lot their whole entire time. Like I only plan on spending a hundred and six for it, maybe a little yeah. bit more. And now I'm 180 into it. You know, it's just like you don't. Yeah. Now your money's tied up longer than what it should be. You couldn't do anything yeah. else, and it's just like it bothers me. So, anyways, um, and then we have a five thousand square foot lot in Maryland that we're not doing anything with yet. And then um, I think that's all we got right now. I believe. I think. Yeah. Okay, solid. That that sounds like a a, a big portfolio that you're growing uh, so far. Um, s- especially since you've only been investing since 2020. Yeah. Um, what's three pieces of advice you would give to either a young mid or a young jo? Um, just three pieces of solid advice. You know, what, um, three pieces of solid advice. I would say, oh, well, in in what sense? Like, just in life, period, or just like in business? Life. Okay, in life. Um, I would say be in, anything. Yeah, in life, um, we're all gonna face adversity, right? But understand, because I know there's a lot, especially nowadays with all the talk about uh, mental health and everything like that, right? A lot of people go through different things. I got friends who I played football with at the academy who aren't here anymore. Like they literally, mm-hmm. you know, they committed suicide. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it was, it's, it, yeah, that's something I never saw coming, but it did. Um, so like for those out there, you know, make sure you're taking care of yourself, right? Physically, spiritually, morally, mentally, like truly like, like focus on that stuff. Your health is your wealth. Don't let it go. You know, we're all in yeah. shape of the Academy and some people decide to let things go and not just physically they let their mind go too. They let all, a lot of stuff go. Um, don't like keep it intact. Like we are so strong and we're like the best of the best. Like nobody can touch us. Like literally they can't. So like understand where you're at, understand who you can be and like, just ma- try to maximize that as much as you can. I know life can get tough. You got all these life things coming at you, family, your work, all these things, maybe whatever things happen. Um, maybe, maybe health. Like, I don't know. So you get hit with something that you didn't know was coming, like whatever it is, but like just continue to try to take care of yourself every single day. And it's going to help you stay in the right uh, mind frame to now put yourself in better positions, right. To get yourself in a better financial z- position, physical, physical position, whatever it is at work, professional position, whatever it is, um, take care of yourself. That's like number one, two, 
um, whatever you're going after, whatever you're doing, um, you know, have faith the entire time and put action towards it every single day. Mm -hmm. Every day you're not putting action towards it is another day someone else is and someone's going to get there before you, right? Yeah. You got to wake up earlier than everybody else, wake up an hour earlier than everybody else because that's going to give you seven hours or more on them than they had on you that week. That's going to give you 365 mm -hmm. hours more on them than they had on you that year. Just just get to them faster, right? So people say, but I need, you know, eight hours of sleep. Well, then sleep faster. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. like, like whatever you do, you got to get to the spot before everybody else gets to it. That, that's like the name of the game. Like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's not about talent. It's not about resources. It's not about any of that stuff. Life will reward those who stay strong enough, long enough. Don't quit. Keep grinding. Keep going after you want. So I just want to say, take care of yourself. Put action and faith towards everything you're doing and never quit life rewards those who stay strong enough long mm. enough mm. man you're dropping some knowledge <laughs> jesse where, where, where can they find you at on on social media yeah for sure um i'm on all the platforms linkedin uh uh facebook instagram um x I, i'm on x but i don't use it because too much negativity there i try not to put that stuff like there's just wait everybody's just fighting and there's a bunch of random people who, who aren't strong enough to stand up and like show who they are so like yeah. I, I i stay off of there but um yeah linkedin facebook instagram um all the every platform all you can find me with my name i don't have any code names on there so just okay. look up <laughs> jesse underscore iwuji j-e-s-s-e underscore I W U J I you type that in pretty much on any platform. You're going to find me. Um, usually most of the ones I have blue check marks. I don't think there's one on LinkedIn, but you know who I am on LinkedIn. It's easy to find. Um, look me up. If anyone has any questions on anything or any advice for whatever, just like, just send me a message. Um, I answer, I'm, I get to my, my messages on IG the quickest and then maybe LinkedIn the second quickest. I don't get to the Facebook ones enough because um, for whatever reason, it's not in the area where I can quickly get to. And I just, so I don't get to them very quick. So if you want to hit me up, just DM me on IG. That's probably the quickest way. LinkedIn, I'll eventually get to it. And the email, I definitely get to it every single day. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate you uh, stopping by, Jesse, and, and dropping some knowledge for the goats. I know you're a busy man. Uh, so this I know this is truly important to, you know, the younger generation. So uh, relationships are the most important currency. This is J.D. Kameem and Joffrey Whiteside signing out. <laughs>